Welcome to the App in Top mobile app marketing podcast. For so many mobile app developers, it's an all or nothing battle out there in the App Store. This App in Top podcast is your mobile app marketing advantage. Let's get that new app of yours moving to the top. This is the App in Top mobile app marketing podcast. And now your host, Michael Bauer. Welcome, welcome. This is the App and Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast. This podcast is produced by AppandTop.com. You can find our daily blog at blog.appandtop.com and also track us down at Facebook, facebook.com slash appandtop. And if you are a member of the Twitterverse, then feel free to hit us up at any moment at appandtop underscore com, appandtop underscore com. We all know that when Facebook ads do not work for advertisers, you turn to CPA ads where you pay only when a user installed the app or performed some other action. And to understand the costs and risks associated with buying performance-based ads, we are thrilled today to speak to Kirill Safranoff, mobile marketing professional and the founder of the mobile-first marketing agency, Tap Gravity. Kirill, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Now, we know there's a lot of demand for performance-based ads in in the mobile industry. The most common one is paying per install. Can you walk us through what kind of performance ads are available to mobile advertisers? Sure. So, currently, uh, the industry is quite big, and basically, it's evolving every year. And I think, like, one of the best things about the industry, it's quite dynamic, so people actually have to um, adapt to changes. Mm -hmm. So, currently, we have apps which are able uh, to be kind of processed or installed on CPC uh, CPI basis, um, as well as cost per engagement and cost per sale. Um, Usually, advertisers, um, they started to be quite conservative on what what they want. So, there was kind of an evolution of uh, being uh, basically buying ads on CPC and CPM basis and then evolving into uh, the CPI. Uh, besides that, there is as well uh, mobile content offers, which basically advertisers are trying to uh, get users to somehow uh, submit any forms. So there is a single opt-in apps, uh, uh, ads, which are basically you have to submit a um, uh, a certain form or an email, mm-hmm. um, and whenever you submit it, like you have a conversion, and the advertiser pay the publisher for it. Um, another variation of it is uh, double opt-in, uh, where you basically have to confirm uh, the email, um, and then basically the conversion happens. Um, what is really hot right now, um, there is it's actually quite a new thing, and obviously mobile is like one of the best things to do. So is paper call. Okay. So basically, uh, it's quite a local advertising where uh, people uh, are actually getting getting conversions or they're getting built uh, when, whenever there is like a call happening and whenever you stay on a call, let's say if you're an insurance company, um, you basically have an offer um, and some of the affiliate marketeers basically uh, redirect somebody to a paper call, he calls and he, he stays on a call for one minute or more, he, there is a conversion and you get paid. Wow. So then that's exclusive to the mobile marketing world here. That sounds, that sounds like a pretty aggressive approach. I like that. Yeah, um, like besides that, like I said, like the market is evolving. So every time we see like different models, uh, there is even a hybrid model which basically um, combines several things like uh, cost per install, um, basically get paid first time. And then if user, for instance, reaches the level five in the game, uh, you could pay the second time. Um, it's quite rare uh, recently, but it happens and I promoted certain offers for a while. Um, although advertisers are still kind of, yeah, I mean, researching what works best. And yeah. Kirill, let me ask you this. As, it's, as, as it is evolving, uh, what are you seeing sort of fall by the wayside? What right now is one thing that, that you're seeing in the mobile advertising area that's sort of no one's touching anymore or it seems to have, it's, got, it's, it's going to have its place in the Hall of Fame, but nobody's using it right now? Sure. So, um, I mean, uh, in general, I think it's like in, uh, incentivized installs. Um, unfortunately, um, it's basically something which started in 2009. And actually, one of my colleagues uh, from back in the days in Hitfox, uh, Thomas Zoma, he wrote a really nice article about three waves of mobile marketing. So the first wave um, uh, was in 2009 to 2012, uh, where incentivized installs were like really, really kicking in. Mm-hmm. And everybody wanted to do like a chart run- ranking um, in, in, in the app store so they basically can get organic installs from it as well. And I think this is one of the things which is kind of getting back because the quality of the install is not really good and the markets, uh, like for instance US, they're so competitive right now so that only a few players can actually afford to pay this price for incentivized install in order to reach the ranking. Because at the end of the day, if you don't reach the volume, 
top 10 uh, ubiquitous money and the installs are kind of like they don't like make you even break even on the traffic that you've sent in gotcha. uh, so definitely incentivize installs yeah now, when we're talking about specifically certain different industries, right? I mean, when you're talking about uh, a cost of paying users for games, for travel, for dating, what industry pays most per quality user? So um, I think dating is really specific because um, it's a bit easier to monetize dating. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it actually really depends on the country um, or basically OS device. Um, in general, dating pays a bit more. Um, otherwise, games... Um, and something on the lower tier is basic, basically utilities. Gotcha. What about... Uh, uh, when you, uh, there are ahead. actually as well um, kind of like price outliers, so you always can find an extreme. So for instance, there are games who, which pay only um, 30 cents because advertisers already have data uh, that their users are not paying too much in the game, so they basically put the, the price a bit lower than it's usual. Gotcha. Uh, when you take a look at that, do you find in, in situations like travel or automotive, are you seeing an upswing any place? Obviously, like you said, dating's pretty streamlined and it, it's very focused. Uh, are you seeing an upswing in any particular industry? Uh, well, gaming works pretty well. Um, sure. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, basically, gaming advertisers are really sophisticated. So they've been a while in the market. Um, they know what what their paying users are like. So they usually kind of cap the volume that you can actually uh, achieve uh, with the gaming apps um, and it's not that easy to promote so currently the biggest upswing I see is uh, in utilities and most of the affiliate marketeers will probably confirm that so like basically companies which are turned out to be uh, really really successful with utility apps like Cheetah Mobile which is currently quoting on a stock market um, they basically been really successful because they kind of created a new kind of market for utilities um, and been promoting antiviruses for a while. Uh, besides that, as well, um, banking and automotive, um, they're not so much into um, app installs so far. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, they promote some kind of like uh, sweepstakes offers or something like you can win a car, but you know, they're still kind of lacking of uh, like mobile, let's say, promotion strategies. And I don't see so much of upswing over that. Although, as well, like uh, if you have a really, really relevant relevant traffic for, say, finance, for instance, you're owning a website which has a lot of mobile traffic, you can really monetize it really well, you know, let's say, on the offers, uh, not only mobile, but as well, like in general, in the past, people which are having, uh, basically comparing quotes in certain websites, uh, when the traffic is really relevant, uh, you usually can have, like, really good uh, quality, um, so because users are actually paying, because still financial institutions uh, usually make cost per sale or make a commission on a purchase of a insurance or a car, it doesn't matter. He is uh, Kirill Sofranoff, the mobile marketing professional, founder of mobile first marketing agency, Tap Gravity. What is the market capacity for quality users for games, travel, and entertainment? When you're, when you're paying per install and when you pay per other action, say a purchase. Right. So, um, well, consider that there are like one, two billion smartphones and tablets uh, in the world mm -hmm. or users who are using, using these kind of devices. So the opportunity is really enormous. Um, in general, it's uh, for for both type of type of um, let's say user flows or cost per install, cost per sale. Uh, the market is still big and it's still really evolving. Um, on the other hand, you, you always have to consider that there are more sides to the business. So there are advertisers who are giving budgets for a certain type of offer. Um, then there are affiliate networks who are distributing those offers, and then there are affiliates who actually have to uh, make their bread and butter every day. And they don't like CPS offers because it's much sure. tougher to buy traffic, let's say, and make uh, make conversions and installs basically or basically purchases on a, on a bot traffic. It has to be really relevant in order to be successful. So um, in general, capacity is really huge and it's increasing every day. Uh, but it's it's uh, for certain kind of offers, it's really hard. Um, CPI installs probably or organic CPI installs are still the default uh, uh, thing on the market right now. For mobile commerce, can a mobile advertiser pay per order uh, transaction, if you will? Will that work technically? Um, it can. Uh, they usually actually they started to do it uh, because sometimes when apps are not very successful on CPI, uh, they try to integrate more model which actually works for the advertiser so they don't have to overpay um, the networks or affiliates or publishers. Right. So basically, um, technically it works that there is a possibility to send a device ID and a click. Um, and attribution analytics and tracking platforms can do device ID based attribution, which lasts around seven days. Um, for instance, one of the companies I work with closely just, uh, just, does just that. Um, I actually usually highly recommend it to the clients because they can track most of the attributions, such as the sale as well. Um, Are there risks involved with that? 
Yeah, I mean, in general, actually, the risks are more on the publisher side um, as well. Like when it says performance marketing uh, for the advertisers, it's really uh, profitable or basically it makes much more sense. But for publishers, sometimes it's really hard to make a profit on certain offers. So basically, they have to buy a lot of data. For instance, if you have an offer for, say, which pays uh, $50, have to spend a lot of money to gain a lot of data to get conversions to see like what kind of devices convert and usually you have to spend a lot of money to see if it actually works and usually it actually doesn't wow okay uh what happens if in in let's say if it's a uh, on the the per transaction order uh what happens if a customer returns the order and 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 what do you do at that point because you're counting on the transaction being a big part of the business Sure. Uh, so if purchase is a commission type of a deal, which actually usually is, yeah. uh, so depending on the product price, they might give you commission in the range of, I don't know, 1% to 20%. But then again, um, commerce still promote on a CPI basis. When it comes to returns, uh, usually specified in insertion orders. So it really depends on the advertiser. Um, in general, they might take the risk by themselves and they make no refund policy on commissions. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, it might, it might happen that basically they say, okay, if uh, there is a refund, uh, we're going to charge you back on a on whatever basically has been refunded. We're talking with uh, Kirill Sofranov, uh, Tap Gravity, and we're finding out information on the cost of performance-based ads. When a, when a game publisher buys guaranteed installs from the marketing agency, how does pricing and conditions look like? Um, well, uh, I mean, are there, are there risks of paying higher price per install? Uh, definitely. I mean, in general, usually um, advertisers already have established a certain base for installs, already have some data, what works, what doesn't. So for them, if it's an uh, unsoph- unsophisticated advertiser and he's just starting a user acquisition, um, for them, usually it makes sense to, let's say, test out like uh, a certain price range uh, in a certain country. And basically the agency like Tab Gravity or any other network will give them feedback in a certain while. Uh, if it works or it doesn't. So uh, basically, they're sending them data like uh, sub IDs or basically numbers um, of publishers that actually work. And advertiser gives back the feedback if the installs are quality or non quality. Uh, so at the end of the day, it basically it comes to a communication between two parties um, what actually works and what doesn't. Uh, so there are a lot of like uh, many, many companies currently are doing um, like say technology products uh, which are optimizing um, the installs uh, on the LTV basis, so lifetime value um, because it becomes kind of like a standard in the industry so that basically people do not overpay for their installs. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why it kind of minimizes and mitigates the risk of actually doing or basically being pro- uh, unprofitable on the campaigns with the uh, affiliate networks. Gotcha. When we return here at the App and Top podcast, we will talk about CPI installs and burst campaigns and the strategies behind each with Kirill Sofranoff, mobile marketing professional and the founder of the mobile first marketing agency, Tap Gravity, that's seconds away here on the App and Top podcasts. This podcast is produced with support from App and Top, an automated mobile app marketing platform in App Store and Google Play. This is the App and Top mobile app marketing podcast. I'm Mike Bauer. We are in mid-conversation with Kirill Sofranov, who worked at Hitfox Group, acquiring users and clients of uh, Add to Games, game distribution network that delivers one million users to the world of Tanks, Travian, and other top games, and App Iris, CPI network focused on non-gaming mobile apps and the LTV optimization. Kirill, Facebook, Twitter, and major ad networks do not offer CPI installs. You pay per impressions or clicks. They, they don't want to take the advertiser risk, but... In Russia, Target, Mail, RU has their own CPI product. Do major CPI networks elsewhere have their own traffic? So um, Facebook actually started offering CPI installs as well as Google actually that started to do it recently. Uh, Twitter st- still doesn't do it, but I think you might can come along with the solution as well because it becomes a trend in the industry because advertisers as, as well are becoming more conservative. They want they want to spend uh, money for clicks. And... Um, uh, Basically, in, in uh, Russia, uh, Target Mail started to do it as well uh, quite quite a long time ago. Um, in general, uh, most CPI networks use external publishers to drive traffic, although many has turned into self-serve platforms, kind of a hybrid ad, ad networks. Um, CPI networks also have their own traffic, not so much uh, in general. Uh, basically, 
CPI network usually only uh, aggregates all the publishers in order to drive installs for the advertiser. Mm -hmm. So um, not so much. Like CPI networks usually came along because no, none of the bigger players actually offered the solution, and it become became uh, industry standard recently. That's why most of the bigger players are actually coming coming along and trying to do the same product. Unfortunately, the prices on say Facebook and Google recently are quite still quite high. So sometimes it doesn't make say, sense for advertisers to, to pay such a big price, although everything depends on uh, optimization and basically how campaigns are run and about the, uh, actually the professional people in the company, how they're willing to optimize and what kind of price they're willing to pay for their app or app install. Kirill, when you're, when you're looking at advertisers that are getting a little bit more picky and, and, and possibly even uh, making sure that they're getting quality people clicking through, how can a CPI network manage a risk and still make a profit in that kind of a world? So actually, CPI uh, network doesn't have much many risks. Uh, basically, they're only taking a risk of working capital when the advertiser can cannot pay them. Yeah. Or but they basically don't have any risk on uh, traffic delivered. They might have risk as well on fraud when a uh, publisher actually sends uh, not very good quality traffic or mixes it with uh, incentivized installs. Um, on the other hand, uh, they don't do CPC or CPM models, so they usually don't have any risk. Although, uh, recently, many uh, affiliate networks started to have their own media buying teams internally, uh, which are currently buying traffic as well. So they have a lot of insights which offers are working for their affiliates. So basically, they have an advantage in the market um, in a way that uh, they can actually promote their apps with 100% margin or basically without any margin at all. How does the cost of mobile web traffic compare with CPI and mobile apps? Um, well, actually, mobile is still quite rare in certain countries so it really depends um, but uh, in general uh, web and CPI offers uh, web and app offers can be um, it, it really depends yeah I mean in, in general uh, traffic can be really really similar but it, it, there are, the thing is like there are certain extremes in all, all of the parts of, of the prices mm -hmm. um, and I think web and mobile traffic became really comparable lately I mean in certain traffic on certain traffic sources mobile can be even uh, more expensive depends on really on the country so it's on it's really on a case-by-case -case kind of basis at this point in, until exactly. mobile kind of catches up if you will Definitely. The thing is, mobile is still growing, but before it was really rare, it was quite expensive uh, because mobile traffic is, was there for a while. So if you have premium inventory, you always have to pay like a lot in, in order to actually uh, get the traffic from sites like um, uh, yellow, yellow Pages or Yellow Newspapers, for instance, mm -hmm. which still promote things on CPM basis. Um, if you go for pop hunters, for instance, the price are, is super, super low. So it really depends on the source of traffic and, in general, a case-by-case -case study, as mentioned. Uh, the cheapest users on the market come from incentivized installs. We've already talked about that. So when a CPI network optimizes its profit, the most profitable strategy is to buy incentivized installs and sell them as non-incentivized at a premium price. What's the risk of buying incentivized stalls from any of those CPI networks? Um, well, generally it's actually classified as a breach of insertion order where advertisers usually specify what kind of installs they want. Otherwise, CPI network won't be paid. So. Uh -huh. For the network, it's a risk as it's hard to control publishers when they're mixing traffic. Um, it's actually quite hard to control, um, but in general, as I said, it's usually about the communication between the advertiser and the uh, and the in, and the CPI network because um, it's actually like a lose-lose situation. You lose a client, and basically, you won't get paid. Right, uh, everybody so loses. Exactly. So CPI networks usually make it um, quite trying to make it quite transparent, like where the traffic is coming from. Although there are also always cases when you have to scrap a certain amount of budget because certain publishers were not basically deliver, delivering the quality that they actually asked for. Um, otherwise, yeah, many, 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 many CPI networks are trying to develop, let's say, certain uh, fraud algorithms or certain fraud rules um, inside the company so that these cases don't happen. So speak to me like I'm, I'm an, a mobile ad buyer. How do I get to check the quality of the traffic that's coming through? So, well, usually if you're an ad buyer, you basically have to comply with the insertion order or basically the rules which if an uh, affiliate network is giving you an offer. Um, so whenever there is an offer saying you cannot send any adult traffic, you definitely cannot use the uh, ad networks which are sending this kind of Good traffic. Good point, yeah. Um, on the other hand, most of the people actually started to as well um, forbid the incentivized installs because it's just non quality traffic. So it's uh, it's really about actually compliance. And at the end of the day, as I meant, it's it's really as well about the trust. So this this business is really about uh, people. It's it's really like a pe people business uh, because. Um, 
uh, like I said, there is always a win-win situation and lose-lose situation. Yeah. And you usually don't want to lose the clients because you have to comply with the rules. And how do you protect your client from buying dead users? Um, I mean, aside well, from the communication, obviously, is a big key like you've been talking about. Yeah. So basically, you use proven clients or proven people that you already worked with. So there are like top networks that you're usually using to actually buy traffic from or usually you have a certain ad traffic sources uh, which uh, you already test tested and you know they work. And you know that the ad network won't going to send you bot clicks or dead users. In general, it's basically about knowing the industry mm -hmm. and as well the feedback from, from the advertiser that is actually in combination with the fraud uh, mechanisms of affiliate network uh, that kind of prevent you from uh, getting dead users. Now, I'm not saying that anybody that listens to this podcast has had this happen to them or that they may have tweeted us a question about it. But if a CPI network sold you dead users, how can you get the money back? So um, usually, advertiser actually specifies in the insertion order that uh, all the leads that uh, come from a fraud source or there will be uh, non-quality, um, they will, basically the AC panet were going to get paid and affiliates were going to get paid. Um, that's why basically everything is uh, kind of pre-set in the insertion order, and there is there is basically a rule. Otherwise, they can be sued um, if they weren't going to return the money. So it's actually a general practice that let's say in the end of the month, uh, when uh, advertiser sends a report on the quality of the traffic, um, uh, that the affiliate network scraps the leads or contacts the publishers like, hey, what happened? Uh, why did you send us that users? Or they're going to switch the users up front. Um, in Tab Gravity, we do it on a weekly basis usually. So we so we have reports coming from the advertiser, and we see what kind of users are actually sending the um, quality uh, quality traffic, and which are not. As well as we are only picking when we are actually buying traffic, um, we are only picking networks or. Uh, let's say, certain traffic resources, uh, which always comply with the rules of the insertion order. It may just be me, but it sounds like uh, you guys at Tap Gravity must be really busy then, Korea. There's, there's a lot of uh, information going on there and communication with you guys. Yeah, there is a lot of optimization, but it's like a needed practice in the industry. So um, yeah. I think the, a lot of advertisers actually got burned because they started like with a really high CPI price. They launched a campaign with like 50K budget, um, and they basically swarmed the whole budget, let's say, in a couple of days. And then they realized like, 50% of it is actually dead traffic. Oh. And it, it happens like actually on a like, let's say monthly basis, I would say, with many networks. Because right now, the industry is super competitive. There are right. so many players which are not proven. Nobody knows about them. Um, and they're really, making big claims. Exactly. And it's really hard to establish yourself, let's say, as a quality network. So that's why usually most advertisers actually work exclusively with, let's say, two, three networks um, they use you know, because they know they already work with them with a really, really long time and they know that they bring quality users. They know where their traffic is coming from and so on and so forth. Uh, he is Kirill Safranoff, the uh, founder, mobile first marketing agency, Tap Gravity, uh, on the App and Top podcast here. Let's talk a little bit about burst campaigns here. Sometimes you need incentivized installs to run burst campaigns to get to the top of the ranks within a very short period of time. What volume of ascent traffic can you get per day in your mind? Right. So it's really highly dependable on the country and traffic availability for this specific time frame. Um, it really depends on the country. In general, there are certain, I mean, if you aggregate sources, um, you can get dozens of thousands of installs per day. Um, it only depends like what kind of actually sources you want to use. So usually what I do or, or what we do um, is that we only use the sources that are proven and with which we work with uh, for a long time. Um, and uh, the volume of traffic, I know that they're going to basically comply with it and they're going to deliver. Um, there happens many times that when you basically plan a media buying campaign or basically there is a, let's say, incentivized campaign happening uh, burst between in, during the weekend, uh, that some uh, partners don't deliver, which unfortunately actually happens very often. So you always have to be prepared for these kind of cases. And that um, basically have to be ready to engage another source or basically come up with another solution. Yeah, I would imagine relatively quickly. So so I guess what, what I'm hearing from you is that Tap Gravity has got the best sources and you keep up on track with who those sources are. Definitely. So in general, I've been in the industry for the last two years. So I basically know most of the people who are actually working in the industry. So whenever I need, let's say, or I have a client who needs a burst campaign during the weekend, um, I basically call out the sources. We prepare like kind of research, um, what, what kind of volume we can actually deliver during that time. Um, and afterwards, we basically as well consult with the client, like what, what does he actually need, um, and then use the sources in order to deliver. Of course, thing, like, things might go bad, like most of the uh, 
installs are actually coming uh, during the weekend because it's mm -hmm. the best time to have burst campaigns. Um, so, you know, uh, um, like managers who are actually my contacts in those networks might be out uh, during the weekend and uh, you usually have to basically be active all the time in order to monitor the campaign and deliver it as, 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 as big as possible. Now, for example, one of uh, its burst campaigns, Wuga, worked with 23 ad sources. Give us some examples of ad networks advertisers should work with. So um, there are really high-profile sources like um, Fiber, for instance, um, or Tabjoy or Supersonic Ads. I really highly recommend those sources for any who basic for any person or any company who would like to get incentivized installs uh, or want to have a burst campaign. Um, I think they're quite reliable. I worked with them for quite a long time and uh, yeah, I think they're one of the best ones in the market. On the other hand, there are other sources which are not that high profile but can work as well. But at the end of the day, I think it, everything comes to experience. So uh, in general, if you have worked with the source which worked quite well, you should, be st you should be still continue working with them and see if you can test others, for instance, when there is a chance. Kirill, do you have any, let's say a mobile marketing agency wants to implement a burst campaign, do you have any advice for them? How many hours does it take to prepare? All that kind of stuff. What, what are the most time consuming and, and what should go into play advice wise from you in regards to a burst campaign? Yeah, so um, in general, it's actually a bit time consuming because you need to prepare, you need to talk to the client. Uh, basically, we would start speaking about date, volume, price, uh, geos, what kind of countries we're going to run in, as well as goals of the campaign and relevant KPIs that we'd like to achieve. Um, in general, it takes several days to prepare a campaign because sometimes uh, some uh, sources might have, uh, let's say, full traffic. <laughs> so mm -hmm. basically, they already have been running the campaigns and won't have the availability in a certain geo. So I would definitely uh, recommend to prepare the burst campaign at least several days or best best case scenario, two weeks in advance it's because there is more, basically, the more time there is, there is a bigger opportunity of success. Yeah, it's certainly uh, going forward that you want to have that. <laughs> Think about the success opportunity and giving yourself plenty of time. The last thing you want to do is wing it and then go, where did all the success go to? Why didn't we have enough time to make this happen? Uh, Kirill, here's what we're going to do when we return. So we've planned our burst, but you want to go global, right? You're thinking about the global launch. What is it you should keep in mind when selecting countries with Kirill Sofran, a founder of the mobile first marketing agency, Tap Gravity, coming back in seconds here on the App and Top podcast. This podcast is produced with support from App in Top, an automated mobile app marketing platform in App Store and Google Play. This indeed is the App in Top mobile app marketing podcast. I'm Michael Bauer, your host. We would love to hear from you with any thoughts, questions. Send us your comments via Facebook at facebook.com slash app and top or tweet us your questions, comments, and thoughts at App in top underscore com. App in top underscore com. Now, if you're looking to understand the costs and risks associated with buying performance based ads, App and Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast guest today is Kirill Sofranov, mobile marketing professional and the founder of the mobile first marketing agency Tap Gravity. He knows a thing or two about it. So, Kirill, on a global scale, what should mobile developers keep in mind when selecting countries for a global launch? So uh, they should definitely consider the geos and the countries. Um, in general, most of the people want to launch in the U.S. because it's the most quality market. Uh, there are a lot of users. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really, really competitive. So recently, a lot of advertisers turned into emerging markets like Brazil or Russia. I think those markets are kind of emerging right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really big. There are a lot of quality users who are willing to pay in their apps. And there is something uh, to win big there. Um, basically... Um, in general, of course, the pricing as well will be much higher in the U.S. than, let's say, in Thailand. Uh, it's like uh, everywhere there is, a, there is an opportunity. It's just a matter of what kind of users would like to engage in and what kind of markets are core markets. Um, U.S. is actually really non-recommendable currently because there is a lot of uh, going on there. There are a lot of apps launching. And it I was going to say quite a flood going on in the U.S. right definitely. now. Yeah. There is, you need a lot of budget, actually. Only a few players in the market can actually afford it. So if you divide, the let's say, the client's... Uh, by um, the ones, the big players who have a lot of money, they can, of course, launch a burst campaigns. But for the developer who only just started and basically he developed his, his first game, uh, the user acquisition in the U.S. doesn't make sense, or at least on a burst basis. So in general, I would really recommend to start with the organic installs and start small to see what the quality is and basically keep communicating with the um, agency or um, a network in order to see um, uh, how can you increase the, in the volume or how can you increase the quality. 
Now, Kirill, one other question I have for you, sort of the back end of that one is, what's one thing that mobile developers should avoid when it comes to a global launch? So definitely avoid shady networks. Yes, <laughs> yes. Shady, shady clients or shady, shady, shady people. So like I said, the industry is booming and there are a lot of players um, trying to engage in the market. What right now is happening is there's, there is a lot of rebrokering. So for instance, uh, Supercell, Supercell st- uh, stopped working with Appia because they were rebrokering some traffic, unfortunately. And that's, what happening because, that's what's happening in the market because there are so many players. They don't have um, contact with direct advertisers. So they take the offer and they rebroke it within other networks. And basically, there's, there is a huge chaos. There was a case study actually happened to me um, when I was still working in Hitfox. So we had a burst campaign and we basically engaged like five networks. And the campaign came along like through so many sources that it actually it come back, came back to me. And somebody basically offered me the same campaign that we were actually kind of promoting. And I was like, hey, what the hell? Like, on, you cannot rebroker. Right. So, in general, I would basically avoid uh, networks and agencies without any reference or when nobody is actually talking about. Um, otherwise, you won't basically know where their traffic is coming from. Although they can bring some installs, uh, it definitely depends on the budget. If you don't care about the quality and you only need uh, like any traffic whatsoever, of course, you can engage with any any kind of player in the market. But in general, just basically keep in mind uh, who you're working with. Now, you mentioned that it's pricey to, to get into the U.S. market. What, what kind of budget would you be talking about to get, uh, say, to the top 10 ranks of the U.S. gaming category? What should, you, what should you have aside and ready to write a check for in order to do that? Right. So, well, it's... It's, it's a really, lot. I know that, right? It's, uh, it's like, I think you have to have at least 50,000 installs per day plus in order to get to the 10 ranks daily. That means you have to run for a couple of days with this kind of amount of installs in order to become the or come to the top ten ranks. It would cost you seriously like thousands, like dozens of thousands of dollars, uh, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, to actually achieve that kind of a success. That's why I mentioned that only big players usually use the burst campaigns in order to get the traffic because not actually many developers can uh, can afford it. But at the end of the day, there are, like there are many products currently on the market uh, which allow you to, to do, like to small developers to actually do uh, certain user acquisition efforts uh, for a smaller price and uh, they're organic. Because at the end of the day, uh, burst campaigns, they're good for a certain like amount of time. Mm-hmm. I think from statistics I read a long time ago, uh, for each uh, incentivized um, app uh, install that you get, you get probably around 50, uh, 0.50 um, of organic user, let's say, because they see the app they're going to install. Mm-hmm. So in general, like the virality factor is not that big and uh, it makes sense really if you have a big budget. But uh, for smaller developers, which is uh, actually a majority of the app stores, um, doesn't make much, much, much sense. Our last question for you here, Kirill. Um, why should an advertiser go to a marketing agency? Uh, who is your typical client? And then when you're thinking about it from that perspective, uh, what, are, what, what should somebody be expecting to pay? Sure. So TapGravity's main focus um, basically are advertisers who don't have enough manpower to deal with 30 plus networks as well as know-how or experience with user acquisition. Mm-hmm. But we as well work with clients who just need additional volume to their current mobile marketing activities. So currently there are kind of two business models. Uh, one is where I was talking about basically the whole podcast, um, which is basically an agency model where I have direct advertisers and now we can solve them and helping them achieve their goals and revenues. Um, the other model is like we do our own media buying. So we basically work with a variety of uh, uh, ad networks and we drive installs to their office by buying traffic on CPC and CPM, CPM model and we basically risk our own money to get our own return on investment let's say and arbitrage um, in general the fees for agencies uh, agency model is around 10 to 15 percent uh, on the CPI uh, or on the budget uh, in terms of media buying, we just usually take the offer from the affiliate network or advertise it directly and start buying on the um, on the uh, on the ad networks, or just basically do both models combined. Is there uh, an adver- a suggestion you would make why an advertiser wouldn't go to a marketing agency? Um, usually, actually not. But like, if somebody wants to try, like generally media buying, they usually just go through affiliate network and buy them themselves. So there are many affiliate affiliate guys out there, and it, the affiliate world is quite huge. So if if you're starting, I mean, it doesn't make sense to actually go to the agency. Uh, but sometimes, like, if you really want to, if you don't, if you really don't have an experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it makes sense to consult first. I mean, we don't we don't take any money for consultation or at least first consultation. Uh, and we can give you all the information you need to start on. Gotcha. So if, if no matter what, if you're starting, 
Tap Gravity is a great place to start out, to look at and to have a discussion with and then make your decision based upon there. See if it's financially feasible for you. But also just thinking of, again, the hours, the man work and the communication that you guys put in uh, for the feedback aspect is fantastic. So um, there, it's there for you. Talk to them about it and then make your decision going forward. Listen, Kareel, thank you so much for taking the time today. For the past 30 minutes, you've walked us through the sometimes wild world of performance-based mobile ads. You gave us the things we needed to know about the cost, traffic concerns, and what burst campaigns can do for you. Uh, officially, you are now free to go. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And to all of you, thank you very much for listening. This has been the App and Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast. Make sure you visit our daily blog at blog.appentop.com where you can find all this great information and much, much more every single day. Until next time, I'm Mike Bauer. See ya. The App in Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast is produced by appintop.com.